We know if it doesn't progress. Uh, so welcome. Thank you, Raja and uh, Mary, for that nice introduction. Actually, it's been 45 years <laughs> that I've been birding. And uh, I like the opening shot that you had on the agenda page. There were all least sandpipers, but if you look closely, there was one Western sandpiper mixed in there uh, in the shot. But birding Santa Clara County, that's what we're going to be talking about today. And as Raja uh, said, I'm the executive director of Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society, and our website can be found right there. I want to first tell you a little bit about who SCVS is and what we do. So this is our headquarters in Cupertino at McClellan Ranch. Uh, it's an old historic uh, farmhouse. Um, and uh, we have offices there and a small nature shop. And we run our programs out of this small historic building. So our mission uh, is to promote the enjoyment and understanding and protection of birds and other wildlife by engaging people of all ages in birding, education and conservation. And I'll tell you more about each of those in a moment. But we like to say that we've been inspiring birds to inspiring people to care about birds since 1925, which means we're coming up on our centennial celebration in two years. We are a 501c3 organization, which means that our, your corporate matching program uh, is eligible for this and or we're eligible for your corporate matching program and we would greatly appreciate contributions or memberships which of course would be matched by HP. So what do we do uh, with all this nearly 100 year history? Well, if you look at our website, you'll get a good sense right away of all the things that we're involved in. You just scroll down the homepage and you'll see tons of news items about upcoming events, our newsletters, uh, programs, presentations, classes. It's a really active presentation. On our site also, there are two of our annual reports downloadable. I'm currently working on the third. Uh, and the first one is particularly nice because it was a big printed piece. And these are pages from it. And it talks in great length about our education and conservation programs. And it's really a, we're worth a look. One of the things we're very proud of is our education program. And this is Carolyn Knight, the education and outreach manager who works right beside me. Uh, giving a presentation to fourth and fifth graders at a local school on bird adaptation and identification. We also have an active wetlands discovery program, which has been in operation for more than 35 years, I believe. And we take school children from third to fifth grade to wetland areas like Palo Alto Baylands and Charleston Slough, where they get firsthand experience with nature and birds. And in some cases, this is their first real Act, uh, legitimate encounter with nature and the outdoors. So we're really excited about that. We also have a high school program uh, for Mid-County and some of the less un underserved schools uh, in the Gilroy and uh, uh, Morgan Hill area. Our cavity nesters program uh, is geared towards uh, adults, but also welcomes children. These set up nest boxes, which were originally intended to protect our uh, locally threatened Western bluebirds. But there are a number of birds that make use of these nest box and uh, nest cavities are actually in short supply. So uh, this is a really uh, important conservation project that we have going in or working volunteers to set up strings nest boxes or monitor existing strings. Egret Office Hours is a program we have on Google Campus where uh, we the street on Shorebird Way is, is closed off during the breeding season. And we set up a table and answer people's questions about the egrets that are breeding there in the sycamore trees over the road. And we answer questions and lead people around walks. So you can see here uh, some of the nestlings at the rookery on Shorebird Way on the Google Campus in Mountain View. And another part of our organization is the environmental education and environmental advocacy um, aspect, which is uh, run by Shawnee Kleinhouse, who's been a long term advocate for us. And she monitors um, activities along our waterways, uh, bird safety design, uh, large developments to make sure they're aware of the importance of bird safe design and how they can create uh, good bird habitats within an urban area. One of those projects was the burrowing owl project. This is a, an endangered species in our county. The numbers have dropped precipitously um, in the last 50 years, and we now have a very small population which we monitor and we help to restore their habitat to make it suitable for them. This is our only diurnal owl, which means it hunts and is active during the day. And it's also pretty unique in that it nests underground in old squirrel burrows. 
Other um, environmental issues are the dark sky initiatives that are happening um, across the state and across the nation to help keep our night skies dark. Uh, with the uh, settlements of, of large urban areas like Silicon Valley, we get increasing amounts of light pollution at night, which is, of course is really disruptive for migrating birds and other animals such as bats and insects. So as our sky gets lighter and lighter, we see more of a threat to our local avifauna particularly. So we're working with various cities to help uh, get them to lower their light levels in areas and use cooler temperature lights to help um, um, avoid some of the problems associated with the bright cold lights. On our Facebook page, uh, we put many, many posts, including this one from last year about our birdathon. A spring happens every spring. This is a fundraising uh, program where teams go out and monitor and count birds, as many as they can find, to raise money for our education programs. That's one of our largest fundraisers each year, and it starts in March. So if any of you would like to join a team or, or help out in any way, uh, the uh, applications will be open pretty soon. Instagram, of course, is another social media outreach uh, channel for us, and we have a pretty active uh, channel there with lots of posts weekly about bird quizzes and upcoming field trips and upcoming programs. It's worth a look. It's a lot of fun. And uh, the last channel would be YouTube, which we really started to get going during the pandemic, and we populated it with tons of content because we couldn't meet in person for our normal field trips. We started to promote uh, our activities online through these virtual meetings, and uh, this has been very successful. We've got a couple of hundred videos, I believe, here already from classes to presentations and um, virtual trips. So that's worth a look. Members get uh, four seasonal newsletters, which are colorful and filled with images and stories about local birding and conservation issues and education projects and opportunities for volunteers. And also there's a monthly uh, emailed update to kind of catch, capture all the things that we don't actually get printed in the, in the seasonal uh, quarterly avocets. We've got three publications that we're very proud of, Birding at the Bottom of the Bay. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. And our Breeding Bird Atlas is a catalog of all the 177 species that actually breed in our county. But that's not all the species we have here, but those are the ones that actually choose this area to nest. And finally, our checklist, which was just revised a few days ago on my birthday for the second time um, in, in a row. So we'll be doing this annually to incorporate new sightings, new birds, or changes in the status of our local birds. So once again, if any of these things appeal to you and you're interested in making a contribution or supporting us in any way, I want to remind you that HP has a corporate matching program. So that uh, would be very helpful to us. But let's get to the topic at hand today, which is birding. What is birding? It's the practice of observing birds for pleasure, fulfillment, relaxation, and science. And I really like to emphasize that last word because what we do as birders contributes directly to our, our uh, database of knowledge. I'll show you a little bit more about that later. But for most of us, it's a lifelong passion and it's a welcoming community for newcomers. And I certainly was welcomed 45 years ago when I joined and and I'm finding that uh, birders are generally nice people. So <laughs> good, <laughs> idea to, good idea to get to know a few. And what a fashion it is. I mean, people sometimes drop everything when someone reports a rare sighting. I mean, I've seen. Oh, <laughs> absolutely, yes, for sure. So a simple fact is that there are 50 million people in the United States that call themselves birders. And this is everything from backyard bird feeder watchers to people who chase rarities all over the country. 50 million people, 50 million friends that you could have if you begin birding. And it's also one of the fastest growing activities in the country. That is except maybe pickleball, which is growing pretty fast <laughs> too. <laughs> and in our uh, county, there are 413 bird species that have been recorded. That's, uh, remember the 177 breeding birds, but 413 species in total, including the very rare birds. So we're going to talk um, about how to find and how to recognize some of the most common birds in our county. And, and hopefully uh, you'll re remember some of this next time you go outside. So our activities are limited essentially to Santa Clara County, which is 1,304 square miles. It's a big county and uh, it's in the center of it runs through um, Silicon Valley or Santa Clara Valley. And then on the east, we've got the Diablo Range. On the west, we've got 
the Santa Cruz Mountains on to the south, we've got agricultural fields in and around the Gilroy and, and, uh, and Morgan Hill area. So in 1983, we wrote this book, which was a series of articles about hot spots, good places to go for birding, and there were maybe 60 or 80 or so spots, maybe uh, somewhere around there. And we've revised this several times as a printed book, but recently we decided to put all that material online and we've changed the title to self-guided field trips. So now we have over 100 articles of, of our self-guided field trips written on an interactive map on our website. And this helps a lot of people find good places to bird when they're by themselves, when they're visiting the area, and especially during the pandemic when we weren't uh, allowed to run in-person field trips. So on our website where those self-guided trips reside, you can find um, a title and a summary of each report. You can click for more information uh, to get detailed account of that area and the birds you'll find there. More and more of these are now written in Spanish as well. We're working on Vietnamese and Mandarin. So hopefully we'll have four languages represented on our website for people to utilize these really fantastic uh, written accounts of the areas that we visit on our field trips. Just a quick example of one of these accounts. There's a description of the area, a description of what the facilities are like and how accessible it is, an interactive map to help you guide yourself through the area. Keep in mind that this is what we used to do on our in-person field trips, and all these accounts are written by our very experienced leaders. So they know these areas like the back of their hand. And we're helping people get a sense of these areas, uh, even when we're not around to to help guide them. But we still run our field trips, of course, and that's one of the favorite things that we do is uh, dozens and dozens of field trips every year. So what do birders notice when they go birding? Um, it's an important thing to ask, actually. Well, how do you begin birding? Well, you want to be sensitive to what we call field marks. This is a simple concept, but they're there are portions of the bird or bright colors or patches or patterns on any bird that might help you identify the bird when you look at a field guide. So, for example, this red epaulette on this red winged blackbird, we simply call it a color, a, a red patch on the bird's wing. But these all have technical terms. The eyebrow over this Buick's Wren's eye is actually called a supercilium. The faint bars on the back are called faint bars. <laughs> But most of these most of these terms, these field marks have proper names. The bars on the tail, the rusty coloration or the checkerboard pattern of this red shouldered hawk's uh, wing in flight, all really useful field marks. Some of these field marks are structural also, such as the pointed wings of these birds or the forked tail. Not so much colors, but shapes and structure of these birds. This is a barn swallow. Birders also pay really close attention to habitat. The tidal wetlands is one of our signature habitats. This is Palo Alto Baylands, the oak savanna that we see in areas like Rancho Naturalista, or Rancho uh, San Antonio, or um, Cañada del Oro uh, in Morgan Hill, and old growth forests in the Diablo Range. We also have chaparral, which is very familiar to all Californians, riparian woodland, and finally, urban areas like your neighborhood park. So there are a variety of specific birds can be found in each of these habitats. And that's what makes looking for habitats really special. A birders also pay attention to the behaviors that they see. For example, is the bird climbing up a tree like a woodpecker would? Is it hovering in front of the flowers like our various hummingbirds would? Is it feeding on the ground like most of our sparrows do? Or is it climbing down a tree kind of like a nuthatch, which is really the only bird that does climb down a tree? <clears throat> so behavior is just as useful as field marks for identification. So we have two things. We've got behavior, we've got field marks, and we also have sounds. I'm hoping you're going to be able to hear this. This is our golden crown sparrow, a really kind of sad three note song. Let's see if you can hear it. That's a pretty common sound in winter time uh, as the golden crown sparrow shows up only during fall and winter in our area it leaves early spring and as hummingbird if you're familiar with that bird such a beautiful small uh, ruby red throat and head but the song is something quite different it's just a buzzy scrapey kind of toneless white noise 
And the red-tailed hawk, I'm sure you'll recognize this if you've watched any movies that are set in the in the West or in the desert. You'll hear this sound uh, to represent pretty much any bird that's flying overhead. I've even heard that in car commercials for sure. So the uh, experienced birders use their ears just as much as they use their eyes. I know I do. Most of my birding, in fact, 95% of it's probably done by sound. Um, of course, I love to see the things too, but I can't always see them. So being attentive to sound is, is really important. So let's meet a few of the birds that I've been talking about just so you know uh, what to look for. And I'm gonna ask you, what field marks do you notice when you see these, uh, these birds? The first habitat will be Bayfront, and uh, Raja had asked me to identify some good spots to go, uh, hot spots for birding. Palo Alto Baylands, the Don Edwards National Wildlife Refuge, or Charleston Slough. These are all fantastic areas located right on the bay. And Palo Alto Baylands is just 10 minutes drive from our office, guys. You know, oh, fantastic. Yeah. That, would make, that would make a great lunchtime field trip, <laughs> depending how long your lunch break is. But yes, the Bayfront Habitat. So these are three of the of the very large number of good spots to go. And once again, uh, this is the Palo Alto Baylands, but specifically it's the Harriet Mundy Marsh. So this is completely submerged during high tide, the, the king tides. And uh, this pool here becomes kind of a muddy basin uh, during the low tide. So that's kind of an interesting phenomenon. The habitat changes so dramatically over the course of 24 hours. San Francisco Creek, uh, this is the delta right uh, on the border between San Mateo and Santa Clara counties. And Salt Pond A1 at Shoreline Park. Uh, this is a remnant of the old Cargill properties, uh, but now it belongs to um, the city and uh, it's kept as a, a basin for waterfowl during the, uh, mostly during the winter. If you travel out on a bicycle on the Don Edwards, Don Edwards Levee Trails at the Wildlife Preserve, uh, you'll come across some old Cargill um, structures like this, which would, would be a dividing line between two ponds. Some of the birds you're going to see there is, of course, our avocet, the uh, uh, mast mascot for our Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society. This is a breeding bird with an orange head, and here you see a pair doing a courtship dance. But during the, um, during the winter, they look a little bit different. In flight, they have a pretty remarkable color pattern or, or black and white pattern on these wings. It makes them very distinctive, even at a great distance. But look at the orange heads there and the grayish heads here. This is what we're seeing right now because we're basically in the middle of winter as far as the birds are concerned. And they, they lose that orange coloration. <clears throat> the foresters turn it's a pretty common turn in our area. It's very fond of freshwater ponds, but we do see it out on the old salt ponds, foraging for fish, diving for fish. These are relatives of, of uh, gulls, but uh, much more delicate, uh, much more graceful on the wing. And during the breeding season, they perform these beautiful kind of ballet, aerial ballets. It's called vole planing, where they accompany each other close together like this and fly um, uh, in unison. During the winter, again, uh, some of the birds change their appearance. This is an adult, just like the other two, but it's lost the black cap, and instead it has a black kind of slash behind the eye, black mask uh, behind the eye. It's hard to go to the baylands or any of the coastal, any of the uh, bayfront habitats without coming across American white pelican. It does have a nine-foot wingspan, so it's a pretty big bird and uh, quite beautiful, quite graceful on the wing, but when they come in for a landing, they're pretty <laughs> pretty awkward, I think. Uh, this is a good-sized bird, quite heavy, 15 to 20 pounds, I believe, and they don't breed here, oddly enough, but they are present year-round. It's simply the, the, uh, the uh, breeding birds that leave town and go to places like Mono or Salt Lake, uh, where they find shallow saline ponds that they like to breed in. Green-winged teal is the smallest duck in North America, and we have uh, quite a few here, especially in winter. The female lacks some of those bright colors, but she's still very beautiful and still has that bright green wing, which is called a speculum. Most ducks actually have some coloration on those feathers there. Those are called the secondaries. And coloration or reflective coloration, iridescence on that area is called a speculum. This is a northern shoveler. 
which has a pretty big bill and it's specifically designed to sort of sift off uh, uh, mostly uh, vegetable matter um, from the surface, plant matter from the surface. And this is the female. He, she also has the big bill, but uh, lacks the color of the uh, of the male, the green-headed male. Pied bill grebe. During the breeding season, it has a mark on the bill, which is why it's called pied billed, and an, a ring around the eye. During the winter, though, it loses both of those features and becomes more nondescript. This is a diving bird. Uh, unlike the two ducks I showed you, which can only float on the surface, feed from the surface, they can't dive. Grebes and uh, other kinds of ducks can dive. So that was the bayfront habitat, and I want to take you through some riparian areas. Uh, any of our creek systems, Coyote Creek, Stevens Creek, Los Gatos Creek, they all have riparian uh, riparian aspect to them. And that basically means it's dictated by the water that runs through it. So where I work at McClellan Ranch, we have uh, uh, the lower Stevens Creek. And uh, what, what it, you'll usually notice in a riparian area is a bank of trees that separates you from the water. And then you, you go into the little woodland here, and immediately you're going to see some beautiful uh, riparian habitat, which is rich with plants and undergrowth. And it's just dense, green, uh, beautiful area. Uh, really reliant on the water that runs through it. In fact, an aerial view usually shows riparian habitat quite clearly. I think this is where you... birding by sound helps uh, because it's it's tough spotting the birds. You know? Oh, absolutely, yeah, especially during spring when they're all singing their uh, their courtship mm -hmm. songs. So this is one of my favorite areas of Stevens Creek. This is when the water of the reservoir is quite low. The the south end of the reservoir usually has this really dense uh, willow habitat here, uh, quite a beautiful spot, easy to navigate and also quite good for birds. A good clue that you're in a riparian habitat is if you have to cross a bridge. If you have to cross a bridge, that's a riparian habitat. And next time you cross a bridge like this, take a look at all the plants that surround the water. And I think you'll notice a big difference between those and the ones that are in the meadow. Birds from this area include belted kingfisher. This is the male. And this is the female. You can probably see the difference right away. Kingfishers dive from a, a distance uh, in, headfirst into the water to capture fish just below the surface. Uh, and there are tons of kingfishers uh, throughout the world. Most of them are strongly associated with water and fish, but not all of them. The kookaburra is a desert bird which likes lizards and snakes. But it's a good strong bird with a heavy bill and a great big head and a crest. You can't quite tell here whether this is a male or female. But here you can tell it's a female because you can see that reddish vest that's uh, below the first ring around the neck. Green heron, one of my favorite birds of the area. A small heron, um, let me see about the size of a pigeon, I suppose, the body at least, the neck is longer. And here it is carrying some nesting material um, along a, a waterfront. This is a, a quiet and private uh, secretive bird which forages along the edges quietly, hunting for anything from small snakes to crayfish to small fish, but generally associated very strongly with water and riparian habitat. If you've been to our ranch, McClellan Ranch or Rancho San Antonio or Foothills Park, you've probably heard the loud cries of red-shouldered hawk. This is one of our more common hawks here not as common as red-tailed, but when you're in a riparian habitat, this is the hawk you're likely to see. It also has really strong features, black and white patterns, bars in the tail, and then of course the loud call, which uh, I neglected to put a sound file here, but, but uh, you would recognize it right away, I'm sure. Across the country, they're not always as colorful as the ones in California are. Ours are quite vividly red. Makes it quite obvious why they're called red-shouldered. Hooded merganser, this is a migrant. I think this might be the first migrant I've really spoken about. This is a duck. A merganser is a special kind of duck that eats fish, and it has serrations on the bill to kind of uh, grip the fish, which tend to be slippery and wiggly. So this is the male. Uh, it has a, a lovely crest, which it can erect whenever it's trying to attract a female. And here you see all the males with their crests fully erect and the females with the softer colors uh, on the left of the group. This is common 
uh, in sort of sheltered ponds and riparian areas, even along small creeks. So only to be found during winter. A duck that's here year round, which uh, most people recognize because it's so famous and so colorful is the wood duck. It's one of very few ducks that nests in trees as opposed to on the ground or in the bushes. This actually nests in old woodpecker or squirrel holes in the trees. The male is, is outrageously colorful. The females are much less so, but if you look carefully, you'll see some of the uh, beautiful iridescent, coppery iridescence on the back. They are really shy. They, they actually will uh, flush away pretty quickly if they detect you uh, walking along the trail. So you really have to walk quietly and, and stay quiet, not making too much noise if you want to get a good look at a wood duck. Oak savanna, it, probably I think one of the most important habitats in California, let alone our um, county, Santa Clara. Places to go to encounter Oak Savannah would be Coyote Valley Open Space Preserve in Morgan Hill, Santa Teresa County Park, Ed Levin County Park in Milpitas. And what you're going to see there is stands of oak trees, primarily live oak, valley oak, blue oak, um, and I think those are, that, those are the big three right there. And there's going to be vegetation between, grassland in between the trees. So patches of trees and then wide areas of rolling grass. This is Rancho Canyana del Oro in Morgan Hill, Montebello Preserve, uh, which is in the Cruz Mountains, but there's a fair amount of oak savanna there too. And then Rancho San Antonio, perfect example of oak savanna. <clears throat> but when you get into the grove of trees, you'll start to see a different habitat. And in fact, there's a little bit of riparian habitat off to the right. That bank of trees might be a clue that there's some water on the other side of it, and sure there is. So that riparian habitat there is right inside of the uh, oak savanna. The birds that like oak savanna generally like the open country quite a bit. So American kestrel, it's our smallest falcon. It likes uh, large insects, small reptiles, small mammals, and it actually can see ultraviolet, which allows it to uh, focus in on uh, ground burrowing rodents because they leave a trail uh, of urine uh, to and from their burrows and that stands out like fluorescent ink uh, to an American kestrel. The male is really colorful with bluish grayish wings and a red back. The female has a reddish back and wings, it lacks the blue gray, but other than that they're very similar and they look um, almost identical when they're perched together, but if you look carefully you can see the difference of the pattern on the tail and the breast and the wings. Western meadowlark, uh, bird of open grassland, a beautiful song here. And you might think this bird would be really easy to spot um, in an open grassy area. But when they turn around and you're looking at the back, they really blend into the dried grass of the oak savanna. So they're actually very hard to see sometimes. But it is a very common bird and it does have a, a glorious song. So it's something that you can listen for when you're out in any of the spots that I mentioned. Bantailed pigeon. This is quite a bit different than a regular city pigeon, the rock pigeon. This is an arboreal species that loves acorns and fruits and berries. It doesn't like uh, breadcrumbs or, or potato chips. This is really a woodland bird and it particularly likes the oak savanna. It's also a little bit larger than our regular city pigeons and it's got bright yellow feet and a bright yellow bill. Golden Eagle, you can't talk about oak savanna without mentioning Golden Eagle, our largest, uh, well, almost our largest raptor of the area. Uh, seven foot wingspan, it's an apex predator, and uh, it's quite magnificent. The adult is all dark with very little uh, bit of pattern visible on the secondaries. The immature though, it's got big patches of white, makes it easy to spot. They're both huge. The violet green swallow, this is a migrant. This is, I think, well, maybe one of the few migrants that I'm going to speak about, uh, comes from Central America and it loves the oak savanna where it, uh, where it uh, breeds in old trees, broken uh, rotting trees or woodpecker holes. And you can really see the violet of the rump and the green of the back, which sort of looks like a pool table green. Um, so it's a, quite a vivid swallow, but it doesn't have any of the iridescence that some of the other swallows do have. In flight, they look really short tailed and they're quite common here. You can actually see the color there pretty nicely also. 
And speaking of color, Western Bluebird, I should say something about the color blue, which doesn't really exist as a pigment. When you see a blue bird, whether it's a, a Western Bluebird or a, a Blue Jay or a Scrub Jay or any birds that have blue, you're not looking at a pigment. It's not a carotenoid orange or red like we see on the breast of this bird. Blue is a structural color, which is the result of Rayleigh scattering, which is the same phenomenon that creates our blue sky. So in this case, small microparticles, uh, nodules, are embedded in the transparent feathers, which scatter the light and send to us just the, uh, blue, the blue frequencies. It's just what we see. So I like to say that when you see a blue bird, uh, you're not seeing a blue bird. You're actually seeing a small portion of the sky close to the Earth. And I, I think that's kind of a nice way of thinking about it. The female has much less of that blue, but she's still very beautiful and does have some blue on the wings and tail. This bird is very common here, but it wasn't always. Uh, it it uh, didn't fare very well with com competition against the uh, European starling, which likes to nest in the same kinds of cavities, roughly the same size, which is why our nest box program was so important. White crowned sparrow comes to us all the way from Alaska. And this is an adult, um, and it's very common at bird feeders all across the state during the winter. And the immatures have kind of a buff and brown coloration on the head, but not the white crowned. There are lots of sparrows that have the word crowned in it. Golden crowned is another also very common winter bird here. The yellow-billed magpie. Now, this is a very special bird here. This is what we call a California endemic. It's a close relative of crows and jays. It actually looks and sounds quite a bit like uh, some of our jays. But if you look at the map, you'll see that this bird lives only in California. It's not to be found anywhere outside of California. So that makes this a true California endemic. Out-of-state birders always want to see it, and luckily we have quite a few of them in Santa Clara County, mostly Coyote Valley and in the Diablo range. But it's a beautiful bird, uh, just rich colors of black, white, yellow, and the tail and wings have got iridescent purple, blue, turquoise, green. It's fabulous. Chaparral. Um, again, a really signature species here, very important to California as a whole. So Upper Stevens Canyon Creek Park, um, Coyote, I'm sorry, Joseph D. Grant County Park and Style Ranch, which is a portion of Santa Teresa Park. Chaparral, of course, is short, uh, drought resistant, fire tolerant uh, habitats of coyote bush, Artemisia, uh, California fuchsia, uh, a whole host, a complicated combination of plants make up the chaparral community. And you can see lots of examples of it in Santa Clara County. And even more if you stray open over Mount Hamilton Road or Southern California, San Vicente Mountains in LA County, the largest areas of chaparral, I think in the entire state. This habitat being so important to California, our ecology and our fire history with fires, some birds like it are blue-gray gnatcatcher. This is a migrant that, that travels to Mexico during the, our winter. California thrasher, which is a close relative of the mockingbird, so it too imitates other birds. Um, and long, that long sickle bill is pretty unique. Spotted towhee is a bird you might actually have in your own backyard. It's very common in many of our habitats, but I put it in chaparral because to me it seems most at home in chaparral. The female is not black and rufous, but brown and rufous, or charcoal and rufous, so very similar, but, but still recognizable. The wren tit, very seldomly seen, but quite common. It has sort of a bouncing ball call, which you've probably heard if you've walked in Foothills Park or any of the other areas that I mentioned in the chaparral uh, portion of the park. So it's got this bouncing ball um, kind of uh, wooden sounding whistle. It's quite beautiful and uh, it's not a true California endemic, but almost. It strays down into Baja, I believe, and perhaps also a little bit into Oregon, but uh, extremely Western specialty. Rufus crowned sparrow, really, really tied to Artemisia and a coyote bush. So this is the bird which you could find quite easily in our chaparral, but very difficult to find in San Mateo County, which has much less of that habitat. So the old growth forest, I think, is uh, extremely important. This is the, this is the uh, Santa Cruz Mountain area. 
So uh, Sanborn County Park, Smith Creek, which is a portion of Joseph D. Grant County Park, Bear Creek Redwoods Open Space Preserve, all beautiful areas, and they all have redwoods. Or they have other conifers like Doug fir. So John Nicholas Trail is one of my personal favorites. You can, uh, you can cycle this, you can walk uh, the three miles to the reservoir and back through these beautiful woods with the old uh, growth redwood and Doug fir really quite a beautiful site, but there are other sorts of trees there too. Old growth doesn't necessarily mean conifers, but much of the time it does. Bear Creek, of course, has got a complicated uh, tree palette here. Uh, there, I see some oaks in there as well as the conifers and several kinds of conifers. In this specialized uh, Santa Cruz mountain habitat, we come across northern pygmy owl, which is scarcely larger than a sparrow. But it's a fearsome predator, and it's a, it is another diurnal hunter. So it forages for, it hunts for small birds in the woodland during the daytime hours. And uh, you can tell when there's one in the area because the birds freak out. They start calling and uh, bombarding it if they can find it. They'll harass it until it leaves the area. Or if you make a call like a pygmy owl, you might actually um, get the other birds to respond, warning the other birds that there's a pygmy owl nearby. This is one of my favorite birds. This woodland habitat, the old growth with so many conifers of pine and fir and redwood, all cone bearing trees. This is the home of the red cross bill. And it, you see that unique bill where the tips actually cross. They use this specialized bill to pry open uh, pine cones or, or any kinds of cone to, to uh, get at the kernel, the edible kernel that's hidden inside the cone. So their tongue and their bill are type, definitely specialized to separate the, uh, the cone and extract the, uh, extract the kernel with, with its tongue. And in that woodland area, you can sometimes see them grouped together in tops of conifers, foraging loudly in the upper branches at the very top. This is not a common bird, but it is pretty distinctive for the area. Pileated woodpecker is our second largest woodpecker actually our first largest woodpecker now that the uh, ivory build is gone, but it's uh, as large as a crow, it's equally loud ball, uh, it has an incredibly loud hammering um, sound that it makes with its bill when it's drumming or digging. The male and female are very similar looking, the subtle differences in the, in the amount of red on the head mean that the left one is the male and the right one with the black forehead is the female. And it is a fabulous bird, uh, not likely to be forgotten once you get a good look at it. Red-breasted nuthatch. This is a tiny specialized bird. Remember the nuthatch is the only bird that climbs down a tree. The red-breasted does that, but in a different habitat. The white-breasted I showed you before really likes oak trees. The red-breasted likes the conifers, particularly pines. I'm sorry, particularly redwoods. But here it's flying up to uh, Doug fir. And the last habitat I'm going to mention is urban. Um, Vasona Lake Park, Lake Cunningham, you know, or your backyard or neighborhood green. So any area, any area in Santa Clara County is going to have a complement of birds, including some of your unexpected urban parks. Linda Vista Park and Cupertino. This is a really nice palette of trees here. Lots of opportunities for birds. Door Park in San Jose, again, many kinds of trees, a lawn. Uh, there's going to be worms in the in the grass for robins. There's all kinds of opportunities here for our local birds. Central Park in Santa Clara is famous for being a good birding destination. Lake Cunningham, good for water birds too, but it couldn't be any more urban than Lake Cunningham right in the middle of San Jose. These places attract birds like Black Phoebe, which is our very common flycatcher. It's here year round. And you probably have one in your own driveway because they're found uh, quite close to human habitation. They love pools, they love ponds, they love water fountains, they love water. And they spend a lot of time bobbing their tail, calling repeatedly, and then uh, uh, catching insects. So it's a good bird to have around. Dark-eyed junco, a small handsome sparrow with a black head and uh, brown cinnamon color on the breast and back, and a sort of pinkish bill. It has a really pleasing song. Juncos are common throughout the country, but the ones we have here are the only ones that have got this brownish back. 
This is called the Oregon form of the dark-eyed junco. <clears throat> the female looks quite a bit like the male, but has a little bit less black head. Other than that, quite similar to the chestnut back chickadee, which at first glance kind of reminds us of the junco, but it's a little bit smaller and very different behavior. This is actually a very acrobatic bird. It will visit feeders regularly, hanging upside down to reach the food. Um, it's quite loud, quite vocal, and uh, you can find this in pretty much any habitat around here. But I do like them quite a bit. House finch, I'm sure you've all seen this. This is the red-headed bird that visits our feeders. The female, of course, is grayish and streaky. And as hummingbird, uh, this has got to be familiar to everybody, especially when the males uh, get very excited during the breeding season and start doing their courtship dance. Uh, they're vocal. Uh, they're not shy about anything. They're, they are not intimidated by people or by hawks or ravens. They fear nothing. So they're quite, quite fun, very enigmatic uh, birds. Again, there's a structural aspect to the color of the throat and, and face. There is no red pigment in here whatsoever. This is all the result of structural color. So this is sort of a prismatic uh, actual structure of the feathers themselves, helps refract the light and, and send back to us these layered colors. So we see one frequency, which is its brilliant electric red. Northern Mockingbird, this is the bird that keeps us all up during summertime singing all times of the day. And uh, it, like the Thrasher, as it ages, it will acquire new songs, and it likes to show off those songs to any potential rivals or mates. The more songs that a northern mockingbird can command, the stronger sim signal it is to a potential rival or a potential mate that this bird is healthy. It's been around a long time. It knows its way around. It owns this neighborhood. And that's why, unfortunately, I like to sing all night during the summer and keep us awake. But just think about the effort that goes into learning all those songs. So good, in fact, are these imitations that birders sometimes mistake it for the birds that they're imitating. They really like berries during the, uh, during the winter season, too. Many of our birds do. So good idea to watch, watch those berry bushes. Cooper's hawk is a pretty um, good bird to look for in urban areas because it likes to visit bird feeders. Bird feeders attract small birds. <laughs> and that's exactly what the Cooper's hawk likes to eat. So you may find one in your backyard uh, or your neighborhood patrolling the bird feeders in that area. The adults are blue gray with uh, rufous streaking or uh, barring on the breast. The uh, immature birds are browner and streakier, less color. These birds are uh, really, really fierce predators. They're ambush predators. They have very short wings and a very long tail, which means that they're, they're able to maneuver in and out of uh, bushes, backyards, branches, fences. Uh, it's really quite remarkable how fast they can turn and how quickly they can attack. This is very different from a falcon, which is a, a straight and fast attacker, aerial, or an eagle or a hawk, which captures its prey on the ground after dropping on it quickly. The Cooper's hawk and all the birds related to it are fearsome bird hunters, uh, ambush predators, and um, quite good at what they do. The most common woodpecker we have in the area, I'm sure you've seen it, is Nuttles woodpecker. The male and female can be differentiated by the amount of red on the head. And they're particularly fond of oak trees, although it looks like I'm showing this next to a pine here. But I'm sure you have heard this bird or seen it in your neighborhood. It's, uh, again, very much a Western specialty. So beat birders from out of state are always eager to see the Nuttles woodpecker. And yet it's one of our most common birds. It's kind of fun to be able to, to uh, make out, um, out of state birders happy just by showing them a very common bird. So what do you need to start birding? Um, you're gonna need a field guide and they're pretty much available for everywhere on the planet. And here are just a bunch of, of uh, North American field guides and there are thousands of field guides available for every country of every, um, every place in every, uh, on our planet. The two of my favorites are the Sibley Guide and the National Geographic. They're, they're quite up to date. Uh, they're updated regularly and uh, names do change, range maps change, and uh, innovations are uh, discovered on how to identify, how to differentiate the common birds. So I recognize those two, I recommend those two, 
when you open up a field guide, you're going to see an introductory section which walks you through some of the specifics about birding, like how to identify different parts of the bird, the topography, and some tips on how to identify birds, some of which I've uh, talked about here already. And you're going to get to the meat of the book, which is the species descriptions, where you're going to have a family overview for all the ducks. You're going to see the species name and the description, and you're going to see a range map. And you're also going to see field marks and illustrations. So for the illustrations, we see field marks called out here. For example, the color of the bill of the female mallard um, or the uh, coloration of the male and uh, different subspecies. When you get to the description of the bird, you're going to want to get a good look at that map. The colors represent seasons. So the pink area, the red area at the top, is where the bird summers. It's easy to remember. Summer is a warm color, red. Winter is blue. So we have where the we have the the uh, summer range where it's likely to breed. We have the winter range where it's likely to spend the colder months, and you have the area where the two colors overlap, which is year round, which is purple. These maps are incredibly helpful, and they tell you quite quickly whether the bird you think you're seeing is actually likely in a given area. And Matt, this is just a no quick time check. We'll probably have to wrap up and take a couple of questions if you don't mind. Okay. Well, let me just because I've got. The binoculars, yeah, don't forget the binoculars, yeah. I wanted to mention that uh, you get binoculars for quite cheap, but I, I recommend going to um, Bass Pro to, to try binoculars out for real. Um, up close, you can get a good you can get a good selection there. There are a number of apps that I would love to tell you about. Merlin allows you to identify uh, birds quite quickly by the shape and size and also by color. It'll make recommendations based on where you are because the phone knows where you are. Uh, Merlin uh, Sound ID also will record the sounds near you and tell you what they are. So that's pretty fun. But if we're drawing to, if we're running out of time, then I'll, I'll cut it short here. But I will zip forward if you don't mind to just uh, tell you a little bit, a uh, tiny bit about our um, available classes that we have. There's a class on eBird, which is available for free on our website. And we have a number of classes that are available on our website as well, some free and some fee based. And you get pretty deeply into bird identification there, corporate matching system, of course. And with that, I will close up and take some questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Matthew. And I mean, there is just so much to learn what you said about the bluebirds and so on. And it just reminds me like, uh, it, it, it's, it's uh, you know, the resources that you have on your website are absolutely superb. So my request to my colleagues is if you have the time, please check them out. Uh, and you'll see, uh, you know, Matthew's presentations are are just very, very nicely put together. So well, I apologize so for going over time there. I, you know, no, I get you're, kind of, you're get kind of excited. You know? <laughs> no, no, it's, it, it's absolutely I, wonderful. We have a so few folks who wish you a belated happy birthday, Matthew. And... <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> we did have a couple questions, though. Did you, did you want to walk through them, yeah, Raja? A, a we... quick question: How does light pollution distract birds, and are there anything? Is there anything we can do within our own household to help with this? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, the way birds are distracted by light, um, birds use a surprising amount of of um, uh, star knowledge uh, in order to navigate. You know, early navigators, uh, human navigators, use the stars to help them know which way they're going. Birds know where the where the pole star is, where the north star is. They use that to help them guide, uh, and so they do use the constellations to guide them. If they can't see the constellations, that's a problem. The other thing is, um, the the light period is disrupted when we've got too much light at night, and it is the reduced or the um, expanded daylight hours that trigger hormonal changes in the bird, which uh, in turn provoke them to travel. So birds know it's time to travel when a certain amount of daylight uh, uh, is present and uh, they use the stars to guide them. So if you, if you disrupt the amount of light, you're ruining that whole system. And there are many other ways that light affects birds. It also affects insects and bats for many of the same reasons. Got it. Thank you. And then the second question was, uh, is a violet green swallow not also a desert breeder, say Mono Lake or Big Basin? You know, um, it very, it, I always associate them, at least here, 
<coughs> with um, with oak savanna and the the hilly areas with uh, large trees that have uh, have dried, rotted, burned, hollowed out. Now I wouldn't doubt that they can be found found elsewhere. I just associate them pretty strongly with the habitat I mentioned. But violet greens are pretty widespread. And it would be crazy if birds didn't adapt to, didn't, uh, weren't able to uh, handle more than one kind of microhabitat. So I, I think very likely we're going to find violet greens elsewhere in some unexpected habitats. Great. Thank you, Matthew. With that, we'll let you go. This was <laughs> so wonderful. Uh, so thank you very much again. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much for joining us, Matthew. And if anybody does want to have more information, feel free to contact me and <laughs> if yeah. you want, we'll figure out how to how to show the full presentation sometime. Anyway, have a wonderful day. Everybody take care. Thank you so much for inviting me. And I look forward to seeing you sometime soon. You're most welcome. Thanks, Matthew. Bye-bye. Thank you.